It's um, often the case that I hear Orthodox people that will say things like, I don't read the Bible, I just read the church fathers. Or uh, that's Protestant, you know, when you start talking about the need to read the Bible. As a matter of fact, I even had a priest one time when he ra raised a question, and I quoted something from Scripture. He almost was mocking because it was from the Old Testament. Well, you know, we, we don't need to worry about that kind of stuff. And it's just, it's a shame that some Orthodox people think that it's okay, that it's somehow maybe even more virtuous as an Orthodox Christian to be ignorant of Scripture. But this is not the tradition of the church by any stretch. St. Peman the Great, in the, if you read the sayings of the Des Des Desert Fathers, he has a saying that touches on one of the key aspects of Scripture and why it's essential to our Christian life. He says, the nature of water is soft, that of the stone is hard. But if a bottle of water is hung above the stone, allowing the water to fall drop by drop, it wears away the stone. So it is with the word of God. It is soft and our heart is hard. But the man who hears the word of God often opens his heart to the fear of God. We, as Orthodox Christians, have a faith that is not just an abstraction. We don't, we, we don't have a piety that just consists of, of kind actions or of spiritual disciplines that are abstracted from the content of our faith. And the content of our faith, the things that we're instructed in, how we know what it means to be a Christian, are deeply rooted in the scriptures. And if you're ignorant of the scriptures, you're really ignorant of your faith, and you, you might have a, a, have a simple piety, but this is something that you need to work on. It's, uh, it's, it's crucial. Protestants uh, believe in something that's called sola scriptura, that means scripture alone. And we as Orthodox Christians don't agree with that because we think that you have to have tradition to understand scripture because scripture is part of tradition. But even worse than what the Protestants do would be to just ignore both. And that's what too many Orthodox Christians do is they figure I'll just go to church uh, but they, they don't put forth any effort to really educate themselves in the faith and they don't spend the time uh, studying the scriptures. St. John Chrysostom, if you read his homilies, he constantly talks about the importance of Scripture. Uh, his, so many of his homilies are on Scripture that Protestants actually love St. John Chrysostom to a large extent, although they ignore the things that he says about things like venerating the saints. But they love his commentaries on Scripture, and you'll often, particularly in older Protestant commentaries, you'll find him, him quoted because his, his love for scripture was, was evident. And he, there's a, a homily that he gave on the passage from Colossians 3.16 that says, let, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. And this homily is just, he, from, from beginning to end, all about why it's essential that every, that every Christian study the scriptures. And... When he talks about what it means for the word of Christ to dwell in you richly, he, he, ha he uses an analogy that I'm going to just import into modern times so it'll be a, little, be a little bit easier to relate to. But he says, you know, someone who's rich and who allows the, the word of Christ to dwell in them richly is like a poor man spiritually. I mean, like a rich man spiritually. But someone who doesn't do that is like a poor man. And if you think about what it's like to be a poor man, if you're a working poor person, you might have a job, you're able to pay your bills maybe, just barely, but you're, you're cutting it close, you don't have a whole lot extra, maybe you're, you're going into debt, but you're somehow able to get by day by day. But then imagine if you're that person and then your boss calls you into his office and he says, you know what, we had to cut back and you don't have a job anymore. And so now the, the little bit of income that the poor man had, he no longer has. And then imagine that he has something on top of that, like he is driving home and he isn't paying attention to his speed and the cop pulls him over and he gets a speeding ticket and he, he can't afford to pay the speeding ticket. He couldn't have afforded it even under the best of circumstances, but he certainly can't afford it now. That person doesn't know what to do with that kind of a crisis. And people 
in that situation often wind up homeless, their families wind up breaking up. I mean, it can be a real catastrophe when you're in that kind of a situation. In my secular job, which I'm going to be retiring from on, uh, on Holy Tuesday, I'll have one hour left to work on Holy Tuesday. I'm going to come, go in at 8 o'clock and leave at 9 o'clock, and then I'm going to be done uh, working for the state of Texas. But I used to work in their welfare department, and one of the saddest cases that I ever saw was a guy that came into my office, and he uh, had had previously a good job. He had bought a new truck, bought a home, had a wife and a kid, but he got laid off, so he lost his job. His unemployment check was less than his truck note and his uh, house note, so he obviously was in no position to pay his bills. And then his wife left him, and his wife actually, in this case, left him with the kid. So he had this kid to take care of, and really no means to do it. And so he came in you know, applying for whatever help that he could get, and fortunately this is one policy that they changed, so it's no longer the case. But at that time, if you had a car that was above a certain value, it didn't matter that you owed more on it than it was worth you were just in, ineligible. And that's because you, you hear the, the stories about people who, you know, they go to the grocery store and they see someone who whips out a food stamp card or back in the days food, food stamp coupons and then they drive off in a brand new Cadillac and people say, that's terrible that people do that. Well, you know, if you had a brand new Cadillac but you were paying on it and you lost your job, you might need those food stamps and this guy was one of those kinds of people. But anyway, I had to tell him, you know, his daughter was eligible for Medicaid, but he was not eligible for food stamps. And I almost busted out in tears with him. I mean, they, I, I just felt so sorry for the guy, but that's what it's like to be poor. But what's it, what's, what's it like to be rich when it comes to the kinds of problems that we're talking about? Well, number one, a rich man wouldn't have a job usually that he'd have to worry about getting fired from because he'd have his own business. But if he did have such a job, he wouldn't be in a crisis because he has a, a great deal of wealth to draw upon. If he got pulled over by the cop and he had a speeding ticket or even if his car got stolen, he's got the means to deal with it. There's really nothing economically that can happen to a rich man other than them losing everything, of course, but no, uh, no unexpected uh, uh, financial crisis that's likely to ever put a rich man in a position where they don't know what to do. Well, if you study the scriptures, and you, you have the word of Christ dwelling in you richly, there's never going to be a spiritual problem that you're not going to know how to deal with. You're going to have this great treasury to draw upon. If you have a difficult situation with your family, with your job, economically, if you get arrested, take down to prison, and they tell you they're going to shoot you in the head if you don't renounce your faith, you've got a wealth, you've got a great treasure to draw upon to know how to deal with that situation. And St. John Christum, he says in this homily, Hearken, I entreat you, all ye that are careful for this life, and pro procure books that will be medicines for the soul. If you will not have any other, yet get you at least the New Testament, the apostolic epistles, the Acts, the Gospels, for your constant teachers. If grief befall thee, dive into them as into a chest of medicines. Take thence comfort of thy trouble, be it, be it loss, or death, or bereavement of, of relations, or rather, dive not into them merely, but take them wholly to thee, keep them in thy mind. This is the cause of all evils, the ignorance of Scripture. We go into battle without arms, and how ought we come off safe? Well contented should we be if we can be safe with them, let alone without them. And so the analogy that he uses of warfare, you've got to keep in mind this is you know, ancient warfare, but in an ancient battle, you had your armor, you had your shield, you had your weapons, and you went in there and you were basically going at it with the enemy, and it was, it was a cheek and jowl uh, fight, and, and, and you, you wanted to have all that, that, those weapons, you wanted to have that armor, because otherwise you were just going to be mincemeat. There was no way you were going to make it out of there, and he's saying if you... If you are ignorant of scripture, you're like the guy that's walking into one of those battlefields with just a t-shirt and shorts and, and your, your thongs and, and just expecting that you're going to walk out the other end okay, and you're not. It, it's, it's good if you go in there with the weapons and the armor and you come out safe, but, uh, but if you go in there without those things, <laughs> what are the odds 
that you're going <coughs> you're going to be able to do that. Well, when he when he admonishes the people of his time to go out and at least get parts of the scripture. You have to keep in mind what he was telling the people of his day. And he wasn't talking to the monastic community. He wasn't talking to the assembled clergy of, uh, of his city. He was talking to the common people. And to buy an, a, an entire text of the Bible in St. John Chrysostom's day <coughs> would have cost you about 30,000 denarii. And a denarii was what a working man made in a single day. And so if you are a working man and you, you worked for more than 82 years, and you never took a day off, and you never spent any money to feed yourself or your family during those, those 82 plus years, then you, at the end of that, you could go buy yourself a nice copy of, of the Bible. And so he's saying at least get you know, some portions of the scripture, but even portions of the scripture for people in his times would have been a, an investment similar to buying a house or a car to us. It would have been a big, Investment, and yet this is the standard that he's he's holding his people to. Well, in our time, you can buy a pocket New Testament for a lot less money than it would take if you were making minimum wage and you worked for about a half an hour flipping hamburgers at McDonald's. So, so our ability to to procure the scriptures is is not a problem. As a matter of fact, you can download the Bible on your phone for nothing. The Gideons will give you free copies of the Bible. I mean, it's just, most of us have copies of the Bible all over the place. <clears throat> so getting them is not the problem. As a matter of fact, the fact that they're so abundant may really be the problem. Because, because it's so easy for us to get it, we just don't place any value on it. I was listening to a Romanian priest who lived during the communist period. And he was talking about how they would take a Bible and they would... They would divide it into pieces, you know, so that they could separate out the sections of the scripture, and they would pass it around to people because there were so few copies of the Bible to be available. And he remembered as a youth, you know, getting his little portions piece by piece and spending hours pouring over the scriptures. And when you listen to this guy, what a love for scripture he had because he knew what it was like not to have it. But, but we're kind of like people who live in a city with all kinds of sights, but we never go to see them because, oh, well, I can go see them whenever I want. But you, yeah, if you can go see them whenever you want, but if you never see them, you never see them. And, uh, and so you don't get the benefit. We need to place some, some serious value on this. And um, what St. John Christopher is also talking about is just some of the benefits that we get. He says... You know, do you lack faith? Well, St. Paul tells us in Romans, so then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So if you lack faith, studying the scriptures, listening to the scriptures, are going to help you build up your faith. Are you lacking in hope? St. Paul tells us in Romans 15, 4, for whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we, through the patience and comfort of the scriptures, might have hope. Psalm 118 or 119 in most Protestant Bibles, the entire psalm is all about Scripture. Every verse has some synonym for sacred Scripture. And in that psalm, you constantly hear mention of the benefits of Scripture. For example, if you're struggling with sin, verse 11 says, In my heart have I hid thy sayings that I might not sin against thee. So studying Scripture helps you to overcome sin. Verse 28, my soul has, has slumbered from despondency. Strengthen me with thy word. So if you're, stu if you're stru struggling with depression, despondency, this is a big thing in our time, in our culture, because we have it too easy. And so it's, we have time to be depressed, whereas our, our ancestors were too busy just trying to make a living to be depressed, and so they were a lot happier than us. But the scriptures can help you to overcome that. Do you need guidance? It says, Thy law is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Verse 105. And are you lacking in peace? Much peace have they that love thy law, for, for, for them there is no stumbling block. St. John of Shanghai, in fact, when he was in Shanghai, he, he wrote an, an article on the importance of studying the Psalms. And since we're here in his cathedral, I thought it was especially appropriate to quote it. But he admonishes people with these words. He says, perhaps it will happen that you will die without having once in your life read in full the Psalter of David. 
You will die, and only then will good people read over your lifeless body, this holy psalter, which you had no time uh, even to open while you lived on earth. Only then at your burial will they sing over you the wondrously instructive, sweetly wise, but alas to you, completely unknown words of David. Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are they who search his testimonies, who keep his revelations, and seek him with their whole heart. Do you hear? Blessed are they who search his testimony, seek out the revelations of the Lord, and you had no time even to think of them. What will your poor, poor soul feel then? Your soul to which every word of the psalmist repeated by a reader or a singer over your coffin will sound as a strict reproach that you never read the sacred book. Open now before it is too late this wondrous book of the prophet King. Open it and read it with attention, at least this 118th Psalm, and you will involuntarily feel in your heart, feel that your heart becomes humble, soft, and that the words of David are the words of the merit of God, and you will repeat involuntarily many times with singing of heart the verse of the Psalm, I have gone astray like a sheep that is lost, seek out thy servant, O Lord. Psalm 118 is in fact so important that it's appointed by the Tipicon to be done in the services almost every day. It's part of the weekly midnight office. It's done at, at, uh, part, as part of matins on uh, Friday evening or Saturday morning. And then it's usually appointed also to be done, although m more often than not, not done at the Saturday evening vigil. Uh, but obviously the church would have this psalm being read so often for a reason. That's because this psalm, really, there's so many spiritual truths, but the, but the importance of scripture is one overarching theme throughout the entire psalm. St. Justin Popovich has an essay on the importance of scripture that you can read online. It's on orthodoxinfo.com if you're interested. But <coughs> he says, all that is necessary for this world and the people in it, the Lord has stated in the Bible. In it, he has given the answers to all questions. There is no question which can torment the human soul and will not find its answer either directly or indirectly in the Bible. Men cannot devise more questions than there are answers in the Bible. If you fail to find the answer to any of your questions in the Bible, it means that you have either posed a senseless question or did not know how to read the Bible and did not finish reading the answer in it. How do we approach the scriptures as Orthodox Christians? Well, we have to approach it with faith, humility, and a desire to know God. There are skeptics who study the scriptures and get all kinds of degrees in the, in the field of biblical studies, and it's not of any benefit to them because they're not coming to it with that approach. You have to believe that the scriptures you know, contain the words of God and, and, and then try to put them to, into action. Just hearing the word of God doesn't cut it. Saint, the scriptures tell us you have to hear the word of God and keep it. But when I talk to people about reading the scriptures, and, and I don't know how many other priests do this, but when I hear confessions, unless someone mentions it to me, there, there are three things that I almost always ask them, and one of them is, is about their prayer life, or they've been praying consistently. And at the end, I always ask them if they've forgiven those that have offended them. But I also ask them if they've been reading the scriptures. And uh, eventually, I, I wear people down. At first, they'll say no. They get tired of telling me that, so eventually they start telling me yes. And very often, <laughs> after a while, they start telling me that they were surprised at how much benefit there was for them in it. But the kind of objections that I've heard from people who, about reading scriptures are things like, I don't have time for that. And you know, you know, we do live in a very hectic society, which is why most people don't bother to take a shower in the morning and brush their teeth, because they just don't have the time. So no, that, they actually do that because they place a value on taking a shower in the morning and brushing their teeth. And we, we manage to find time to do anything that we really think is important and so if we place a value on reading the scriptures, we'll find time for that too. Now, it's not the most profitable way 
to read the scriptures when you're reading it on the fly, but there are so many opportunities in a day where there are minutes and maybe even you know, half an hour to an hour that you would just be sitting there surfing the web, uh, playing around, shooting the breeze, doing something that wouldn't be of any great lasting importance to you. And if you have a pocket Bible with you or just the, the, uh, a Bible app on your phone, uh, you can get out the scriptures in a few minutes you can read a chapter of scripture, generally speaking. In a, in a, in a few more minutes, you could read a short epistle. Uh, within about an hour, you could read one of the Gospels. So there are all kinds of opportunities that you have throughout the day. So there's really not a good reason why, in, on most days, you shouldn't be able to read at least a small portion of the scripture. Um, the, thing, the, the key thing is, in terms of your time management, we only have so many days of our life. We're on earth to save our souls. We're not on earth to deal with whatever the, the mini crisis of the day is. So really, you need to think about it in terms of, I don't have enough time not to read the scriptures. I need to read as much of the scriptures as I can because I want to save my soul. Another problem that I hear from people is they say that I don't understand it. You know, I've tried reading the scriptures. Um, but I just can't make heads or tails out of it. Well, there certainly are parts of Scripture that are difficult to understand. And so when you read something in the Scriptures and you don't understand it, you should not allow that to deter you. But it should inspire you to want to find out what those things are. St. Augustine had this to say. He said, some of the expressions in Scripture are so obscure as to shroud the meaning in the thickest darkness. And I do not doubt that all of this was divinely arranged for the purpose of sub subduing pride by toil and of preventing a field of, uh, of satisfaction in the intellect. In other words, where you feel like you've had all that you, you possibly could need, which generally holds in small esteem that which is discovered without difficulty. In other words, like the fact that we have the Bible all over the place, that's one of the reasons why we don't place a value on it. So things that are easy to us, we don't place a great value on it. When we have to labor, that's when we place some value on it. So what he's saying is, is there are things in Scripture, they're obscure, but they're obscure because that's to inspire us to want to find out what they are and to see the value of that which is obscure. But in the scriptures, there's a lot of low-hanging fruit. There's a lot of stuff that, you, that anybody could open up the Bible and understand right away. So there's no reason why you can't start reading the scriptures right away. Now, uh, I'll tell you a story and then I'll apply it to this. When I first became an Orthodox Christian, I discovered uh, the novels of Dostoevsky. And I thought, this is wonderful. I read every novel uh, that I could find. And then when I read all of them, I thought, well, you know, let me see what else is out there. And I, I knew of Tolstoy. I've heard of War of Peace all my life, the, the, the great never-finished book for most people. And I thought, well, let me give War and Peace a shot. And I got about maybe two or three chapters into that book, and my eyes glazed over, and I put it down. And I, I, just, I, I, I literally waited about 20-something years before I went back and tried to read it again. And here's what did it for me, is uh, someone in my parish had donated to our church library the uh, four-part Soviet film, War and Peace, with English subtitles. And, um, and if you've never seen that, it's one of the best movies ever made, and despite the fact that it was made during the Soviet period, you'll be surprised at how respectful it is of, of the faith. Um, but uh, I watched that, and uh, I was able to put a face to these names, and, and one of the things that throws you about War and Peace, if, you're, if you don't understand Russian culture, is the same person might be referred to four or five different ways because of you know, the, the, the way that nicknames, patronymics, and that kind of stuff. And so it's just hard to keep track. Plus, I can't remember how many uh, major and minor characters there, there are in that book, but there's quite a few, so it really is hard to keep track of. But after I saw those, the four-part movie, I thought, well, let me give that book one more try. And I still had it, so I dusted it off and started to read it. I thought, this is really a wonderful novel. It really was. But, but I was then able to see the big picture of the book. I knew where it was going, and also I could put faces to names. And, uh, and, and then, then it really it, it became an entirely different book to me. Well, the scriptures are somewhat like that. If, if you just open up the, the Bible randomly to some section of scripture, 
You can't make heads or tails of it if you don't know anything about the Bible. But what you should do for your children, and if you, if you didn't have this done for yourself, what you should do for yourself is try to get the bird's eye view of the Bible. And one easy way to do that would be to get a, a good children's Bible storybook. Uh, there's one that's written in sort of a comic book format. I think it's like the Illustrated Bible or something like that. But I got it for my kids. And the nice thing about it is it's the kind of book, because it has lots of pictures in it, that you could give to them and they would read it on their own. But I would read it with them too. And uh, it gives you a pretty good overview of the basic stories of the scriptures, but also the Law of God by Father Sarah from Slobodskoy has about 300 pages of, uh, of the, that book is do dedicated to sort of a survey of the scriptures. And so if you read through that, you would know basically the main characters of the Bible and where it's going, and so it would be a lot easier uh, for you to, uh, to figure that out. So that's what, what I would encourage you to do. But... One other objection that people have is they say, well, it's just too big. You know, it's, how am I ever going to get finished with this thing? Well, the thing is, you should not even think about finishing with it because you're never going to finish with it if you're approaching it in an orthodox way because if you want to have the beneficial effects that St. Peman the Great was talking about, about that water dripping on the stone, if you've read the Bible a hundred times, you need to keep reading it because you need to have that, your heart softened by that continual drip of the scriptures. And you're always going to find new things that you haven't read anyway. So what you need to think about is not, when am I going to finish this, but how much can I reasonably read in a day? And there might be some days when you're able to read more than other days, but you want to set sort of a minimum goal, I would say, of, a, of at least a, a chapter or two. I'd probably be better if you did maybe four, uh, if you were able to do it. But what I, one thing I would recommend, because what most people do when they start reading the Bible is they figure, well, just like any other book, I'm going to Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, and I'm going to read my way through this book from beginning to end. And most people who try that method will make it through Genesis, and they'll make it through about halfway through the book of Exodus, and then they start reading about the descriptions of the construction of the tabernacle, and their eyes start to glaze over, and they lose interest. Well... Even those parts of Scripture have important truths in them. It's just that those are some of the more obscure parts. But what you'll find will, will help you keep your interest in Scripture is if you don't allow yourself to get bogged down in one part of the Bible. But put a couple bookmarks in your Bible. I would recommend at least four. Uh, two maybe in the Old Testament and two in the New. But instead of just reading, say, through Leviticus straight through, Maybe also be reading through the Psalms or the Prophets, and also reading through the Gospels and then through the Epistles. Just try to read one chapter from each of those sections. And if you're reading a really dry section of Leviticus and you're not able to make a lot out of it, but then you also read from the Prophets and you read from the Gospels and you read from the Epistles, you're not going to feel like, oh, I'm wasting my time, I'm getting no benefit, there's no point in me uh, continuing on with this. Uh, also, another problem that a lot of people have with, with the Bible is they've had doubts placed in their minds uh, by the society that we live in. It's really a shame because it used to not be that society mocked the scriptures. It used to be that even people who were not serious uh, believers or even atheists would quote from the scriptures respectfully if it backed up what they wanted to say. Uh, but they certainly would not publicly mock the scriptures uh, if they thought that they, uh, you, you know, if they, if they didn't want to have a lot of people expressing their disapproval. But that's definitely changed. And in, in every uh, Easter season and Christmas season, you'll see articles and, and news stories that will come out where some scholar is claiming that they've discovered that Christ never existed or something like that. And they're, these people are, it's just d a demonic attempt to try to pour cold water over people's faith and to cause them to doubt. I remember when I was a teenager, I was watching Channel 13, ABC in Houston, and was watching the, the, the nightly news. And I'll never forget that they, they had a story where some scholars had discovered some Syriac edition or text of the Gospels. And they were talking about how this, was, this discovery was going to revolutionize our understanding of the Christian faith. Well, most of you have probably never heard of that manuscript, and this was like almost uh, 30 years ago, and that's because that was nonsense. That, that didn't revolutionize our understanding of the Christian faith. These reporters very often know nothing about 
the, the Christian faith. And so they misunderstand what the scholars are telling them, and very often the scholars are telling them stuff that isn't true because they're just trying to pump up the value of their own studies, or maybe they're unbelievers and they're just trying to, to bash the faith. When I uh, went to college and I was studying scriptures primarily, and I had a mentor who was the Old Testament professor of the, the, the school I was at, I remember one day just asking him, yeah, I remember hearing on the news about the Syriac, Syriac manuscript and how it was going to revolutionize our understanding of the Christian faith. You know, whatever became of that. And his reaction was just, oh, I don't even know what that is, but don't worry about that. Those people don't get this stuff right. And this was not a particularly conservative professor, mind you. But, but you hear all kinds of nonsense. And now that we have the Internet, which you know, the Internet in some ways is the great equalizer, and that's a good thing and a bad thing. It's good that good people are able to put good content out there and they don't have to go through uh, corporate publishers uh, to, that, that try to filter those kinds of things. And, so, and also it's not ridiculously expensive to get it out there. But it also enables crackpots and people who just uh, you know, hate Christianity to produce stuff where they're attacking the faith. And you need to know that, the, that most of these people don't know what they're talking about. And if you go and you ask someone who really has seriously studied the things that they're talking about, they'll pick the stuff that they're talking about apart piece by piece. Everybody can't have that kind of knowledge. So the thing I would tell you is just trust me, you don't need to be troubled by these things because these are people who just don't want the scriptures to be true. They, 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 they don't want the scriptures to be true because if the scriptures are true, then they know that there's something wrong with their life and that they've got a, a judgment and a reckoning to, to face, and they'd rather not think that. And so they're trying to convince themselves as much as they are trying to convince you that you don't need to be bothered by Scripture. Um, another issue when it comes to studying the Scriptures is the issue of translation. When we were doing the Our Father, I, I, I was chuckling because we got to the, the part where it's forgive us our debts or trespassers, or, or, or yeah, trespassers. Um, and a trip, I don't even know the other version, I'm used to debt. <laughs> now, I'll tell you the, the, the story behind that. Why is it that we have two translations that are almost identical? Well, debt is the King James version, and trespasses is the Book of Common Prayer version. So the Book of Common Prayer had a slightly different version. Uh, so this is a problem we have in English, which you don't have in Slavonic. Everybody, when you sing something in Slavonic, everybody gets it the same, unless you have an old right person around. But, uh, but when it comes to English, we, we have these various translations, and so you do have to have some idea of, of what's a good translation. I have a, a long article on the subject that you can read, and I'm not going to get into all the details of it, but I'll, I'll just tell you what I would recommend. The Orthodox Study Bible is a really good addition the, the New Testament is based on the, it is the New King James Version of the New Testament. The Old Testament, they started with the New King James text, and then they edited it based on the Septuagint. It's not a perfect translation, and the one big thing I don't like about it is the fact that it uses uh, colloquial English rather than liturgical English. But for some people, if you're never, if you haven't grown up hearing the King James, uh, that might be a good place to start anyway, but even if you if, even if you like the King James like I do, um, it's a good text to have around as a reference. It's got very good study notes, and, uh, and the translation is not a bad translation. I mean, it's a, there's a few places where it, it, it might be off, but for the most part, it's accurate, so you're not going to go too far wrong with that. Um, but I would recommend, if you, if you have the ability to do it, that you get yourself a copy of the King James with the Deuterocanonical books in it, and uh, it's a more beautiful text. I, I think that, uh, to, to me, it just resonates in my soul. And, uh, and a lot of people say, well, you know, that's just so archaic. How could an average person understand what's in there? Well, my wife was born in a, in a dirt poor in Guizhou, China. And uh, the, the outhouse when she was a little girl consisted of a screen around a, a, a ditch that she remembers falling into when she was little. And she didn't grow up hearing English spoken at all. Then she moved to Hong Kong, where at least they did teach English in school. But she didn't hear people speaking English all the time, like all of you have. And uh, yet she's been going to church with me, and, uh, and we use the King James translation. And she reads the King James Bible without a whole great deal of difficulty. 
As a matter of fact, someone had sent me some uh, Orthodox uh, hymns that were in Chinese, and they just sent me a, a, a screenshot, and they said, what is this? So, you know, I can read a little bit of Chinese, but not that much. So I forwarded this to my wife and asked her what it said. And I was expecting just sort of a, well, it's this hymn, you know, answer. But she actually translated the, the hymns that were on that screenshot. And what struck me was she translated it into perfectly accurate King James English. <laughs> and, and, and mind you, she didn't even come to the United States until she was 16 years old. So if she can understand King James English, I think most of you can understand King James English. But uh, it's also, it doesn't hurt to have some other translations like the Revised Standard Version or the New Revised Standard Version. They're generally accurate translations, but the prob there's two problems with them. Not only in the Old Testament do they not match the Septuagint, which is the problem the King James itself has as well, but the Orthodox Study Bible does not. Uh, but in the New Testament, they're using a reconstructed Greek text of the New Testament that doesn't match our service. It doesn't match the text that the Orthodox Church has preserved. And, and one thing I, I often do with people who are reading the NIV, for example, uh, or the, the, the RSV, is I'll, I'll say, can you look up John 5, 4 for me? And John 5, 4, this is the passage where Christ is at the pool of Bethesda and there's the, the, the paralyzed man who's waiting to, to get into the water, but he's complaining that you know, he, no one gets him in first because there's always somebody else that steps in before he does because an angel would stir the water, we're told in verse 4. Uh, well, in the NIV, there is no John 5, 4. It goes from John 5, 3 to John 5, 5. And there's a footnote that tells you what John 5, 4 says, but most people don't even notice it. And I would contend that that passage makes absolutely no sense without that verse. And um, there's also the, the people who, who did this reconstructed text in, in mo most cases, the evidence that they're basing their decisions on are pretty weak, but there are a few cases where you could, you could kind of make a case that maybe at one time there was a text that didn't include this passage. The story of the woman caught in adultery is one where there is a lot of manuscript evidence that maybe it wasn't there. For example, St. John Chrysostom's homilies on the Gospel of John don't talk about that passage. And so presumably it, he, he didn't have that text in his copy or... It's also possible that being a pastor at a time when you know, he, he, he's concerned about his, his people, he might have thought, maybe I don't want to just throw out there the story of a woman caught in adultery to, to people who might misunderstand the point. I don't know. But, but even if it's true that there were additions that didn't have it, this was obviously a story that the church preserved. And it may very well be that at some point early on, Somebody said, let's put that text in the Gospel of John right here. It made good sense and we'll preserve it. And it got preserved. The, 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 the main thing is, is the church canonized the Gospel of John with that story in it. And so if you've got a Bible that doesn't have that story in it, you've got the wrong one. Because the, the, this is the text that the church has preserved. And we have to believe that the Holy Spirit has guided the church in making these decisions. And, the, and so... The King James and the New King James are really the only translations in English that are commonly available that really match our, uh, our text of the New Testament. And the, the NRSV and the RSV, NIV, all those don't. However, in most cases, the texts are close enough, and there is some benefit to comparing translations. Because sometimes, particularly if you're reading the King James, you may read a passage and you say, what in the world does that mean? Well, you can obviously go to the New King James. You can get out your Orthodox Study Bible and read what it says there. And maybe that translation will throw some light on it. But if you look at the RSV or the NRSV, you might also get some insights there. Because if you aren't, don't have the ability to look up the original language, that's as close as you're going to come to, to, to getting a feel for it, is looking how, how did various people translate this text. So you get an idea of what the range of possible meanings are for that passage. Um, but one of the great things that we have available to us now is uh, there are websites that have great resources. The Bible Gateway uh, allows you to search any of a number of uh, uh, translations and also other languages, so like the Russian Sonata version. You can do a search on that website there. You can look at the original Greek. Uh, you can look at the, at the Hebrew text. Um, but you can actually put two texts side by side. So if you're a Russian speaker, for example, 
uh, and you want to compare, say, the English text, you can put those two texts side by side and look at them. But if you're just an English speaker, you could put the King James side by side with, say, the RSV or the New King James Version and compare it that way. Um, another great resource that we have available to us is just the ability to listen to the scriptures. And the, the King James is usually available free, but there are also some websites that have New King James and other translations. But like I said, I would stick with King James or New King James. But you can listen to the Bible while you're driving, uh, while you're, you know, if you're doing the dishes or something like that. There, there are tasks that you do that don't require a lot of deep thought while you're doing them. And you can, if you, you, you can benefit yourself by listening to the scriptures. When I uh, first started working for the agency that I'm working for now, I wound up on the opposite side of the city of Houston. I had to work at this office for two years before I could transfer. And it usually left me stuck in traffic for about an hour to work sometimes three hours on the way home. And I know in California, y'all don't have those problems, but in Houston, in, in Houston, we, we have traffic occasionally. Well, I, I listened to a lot of the Bible while I was sitting in traffic, and it made it a lot easier to deal with uh, the, those traffic jams, too. Um, so when you're reading a passage of Scripture, how should you actually go about it? Well, one is you should pray before you read the Bible. You can do as a, a simple a prayer as just singing O Heavenly King before you read it. There's also, if you listen to Ancient Faith Radio, there's a really good podcast. I was talking to Mosh Galena about it last night, but uh, Presbyterian Eugenia Constantino uh, has, has two excellent podcasts, Search the Scriptures, which I don't know if she's going to continue with, but she's got another one. So, was it Search the Scriptures Live? Okay, and so she's right now going verse by verse through the Gospel of John, but whenever she begins her Bible study, she does the prayer that the priest says before the, the, the gospel reading. And that's a perfectly good prayer that you could say uh, before you read the scriptures. And it's available online. Um, but, uh, but when you read the scriptures, you, you read the text, but you also want to ideally chew on it. Or, you know, to use a, 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 an analogy, you ruminate on it. Now, most of us who've not grown up on farms, the idea of, of Chewing the cud doesn't mean a whole lot to us, but but you know when you watch cows out in the field and you see them, they're, you know they're, they're they're chewing the cud. They eat the grass, they put it into one stomach, and then later on they regurgitate that grass back into their mouth and they chew it some more, and then it goes into another stomach. And so that's how they're able to digest grass, and we're not because they 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 they, they ruminate. Well, when you're reading the scriptures, that's how you should be approaching a passage of scripture. In the sayings of the Desert Fathers, you have some fathers, for example, that would be asked a question. You know, what does this passage mean? And you might have a father who would, you know, wait a year before he gave an answer to that question because he would just be praying about it and thinking about it, allowing the Holy Spirit to illumine what, illuminate what that text meant, and then he would give an answer. And one really great way to do this is to memorize passages of Scripture, and it's something that we're, we're not inclined to do in our culture because we can just Google things. But, uh, uh, but if you memorize scripture, you'll discover things that you'd never realize were there because you get into that text on a level that most people never do. So I would recommend that you do it. It doesn't have to be huge chunks of scripture, but particularly some of the more important passages. And certainly, as Orthodox Christians, you already should have Psalm 50, for example, memorized, but it wouldn't hurt you to expand your repertoire a little bit into some other psalms and passages of scripture. Um, we, of course, have to interpret scripture in the light of tradition. So how do you do that? If you're, if you're just a layman and you don't have a vast library of the church fathers, how do you do that? Well, number one, if you just study your faith diligently, if you're reading about the faith in addition to reading the scriptures, reading things that will, like the Law of God is a really basic text, but there's a lot of other books out there that will help you to get a better feel for the scriptures. Well, there's a lot of the Bible that, as far as I can tell, maybe, maybe there are uh, commentaries that just never been translated into English that I've not uh, come across even references to, but there's a lot of passages in the Bible in the Old Testament that there are no patristic commentaries for. And so if we took the, the approach and said, well, I only can un understand the text if I have the fathers to explain it, there's a lot of the Bible that you just would say, well, I'm, we might as well just tear it out. There's nothing, to, there's nothing for us to read there. But how do you approach that? Well, what St. Augustine 
tells us is, is if we interpret the scriptures in a way that's con- that is conducive to loving God and loving our neighbor and it's consistent with the teachings of the church, we're never going to go too far wrong. So you might not be 100% sure that you've gotten the passage right in terms of how you're interpreting it, but if you, if you stay within those basic boundaries, even if you're a little off, you're not going to be too far off. So you just don't need to worry about it. And it's also okay to not understand everything in Scripture because I, I doubt there's ever been a human being other than the Savior himself who has read the Scriptures and understood everything that was in it. People understand different parts of it. People have different abilities. Um, that's okay. First start off with the low-hanging fruit in Scripture and then work your way up from there. And it's okay for you to seek uh, counsel. You know, hopefully your, your parish priest can give you some guidance. There are other people that you can contact. There are people in your, you know, even laymen that, uh, that uh, have, have spent a great deal of time studying the scriptures. So if you start asking around and you have a problem understanding the passage, usually you'll be able to find someone who will be able to give you at least some idea of what that passage means. It's important that we understand the nature of scripture as well. A lot of people, they think that the Bible is sort of like a divination device, you know, that I just can ter- put my finger on any passage and, you know, God, tell me what you want me to know today, flip the Bible, and boom, that's, that's God's word for me today, and hopefully it's not in, in Judas hang himself or something like that. You know? uh, but uh, uh, the Bible is not one book. It's not a novel. It's not War and Peace. It's a whole collection of books, and you do need to understand that different books have different functions. And so, for example, the book of Psalms is a, is a book of worship. The fathers do tell us one thing about the book of Psalms that's interesting, though I'll just mention in passing, and that's that the, the, the Psalms have the elements of all the rest of Scripture. It has the gospel, it has the law, it has prophecy, and it has wisdom. And so, so, so basically, it's got all those other elements of Scripture in one book. So that's one of the reasons why it'd be good get a copy, get, get a copy of, the, of the Psalter that your, your parish uses and have a copy of that and read a little bit of that every day along with the rest of the Scriptures. But, uh, but the Gospels definitely have a different purpose than, say, the Proverbs. And also, if you're reading the Proverbs and you think that these are all infallible pro- uh, uh, promises of God, that's not why they're there. These are wise sayings that are going to generally be true. So, for example, the, there's the proverb that says, raise up a child in the way that he will go, and when he's old, he will not depart from it. That doesn't mean that if someone raises their child up in the way that they should go and they depart from it, that that parent obviously screwed up. It's their fault, you know, because people do have free will. You know, that, that, that passage of Scripture doesn't override the free will that your child has. But it is generally true that if you raise up your child in a, and you point them in the right direction, they, they might get away from it at some point in their life, but when they're old, they're not going to depart from it. So, so these, are, these are things that we, we, we need to know if we want to know how to go about our lives, but we need to properly understand them in the right context. Now, one hard copy book that I would recommend that you get if you don't already have one, and that's a good Bible dictionary. Um, There there was one that was published in Russia that they gave us copies of in 2007, and so I don't know how easy it is to get that. So if you read Russian, that's an Orthodox uh, uh, Bible dictionary. But um, uh, what I would recommend in English, at least in terms of what we currently have available, is Thomas Nelson has a illustrated Bible dictionary. And the reason why I would recommend you get a hard copy rather than just going to Wikipedia is, is the, the, the problem is if you're trying to find out something about the Bible and you're just Googling it, you, you, you do have, it, there's a lot of stuff that's going to come up that may not be great quality material. And if you don't have some background in the field, you, you, do, you, need, you do need to be careful. Whereas I would say that if, you're, if the information in that book is generally reliable, and it's Protestant source, it's obviously not going to be 100%, but generally what it says in there is at least not a ridiculously ignorant opinion about the scriptures. But for example, when you're reading the Bible, it's, let's say you come across references to a Urim and a Thummim, and you're wondering, well, what is a Urim and a Thummim? You can look that up in the Bible dictionary, and it will not only tell you what it means, but it will tell you where else in the Bible it's referred to. Or you might run across the name of somebody. If you look that name up in the Bible dictionary, you might find out that that person appears elsewhere in the scriptures or what is known about that person, and it might shed some light on that passage. So it's really, 
um, a very helpful thing to have. But also, uh, there's a series of books that were published by Johanna Manley. One is the Bible and the and the and the Church Fathers, I believe, is the title. And she also did one on Isaiah and one on the Psalms. And uh, these are all fairly easy to read commentaries, but the one the Church and the, the, the Church Fathers in the Bible or whatever the title is, Johanna Manley, though, I, I got that right, uh, it, that uh, has some, at least some commentary on every passage of Scripture that's read liturgically in the church. So if you do the daily readings and you're wondering what do these things mean, if you have a copy of that book, you'll at least have something to go by. But as I mentioned, the law of God is a great resource. Uh, it's got great information, particularly if, you're not, if you haven't already dug into the scriptures much. There's a really cool app that I just discovered about a year ago. It's called uh, Katina, and it's C-A-T-A-E-N-A. -A -E and uh, I don't know what translation they use. I haven't quite figured that one out because it doesn't seem to be quite of a standard translation, but you've got the text of the Bible on this app, and then if you put your finger and you click on a verse and you say, I wonder what does that mean? Click on it. You, they have church father commentaries that pop up. I, I don't know how they got all this stuff into this app. It's free. I don't know how they pulled that off. It might be violating all kinds of copyright laws. <laughs> but, uh, but it's a great resource anyway. And I'm sure the church fathers would have no objection. And uh, now you can, you can actually go into your settings and you can, it'll ask you, do you want just the church fathers, do you want Roman Catholic commentary, do you want Protestant commentary? So you can check all of them or you can just say I want to stick with the church fathers. Now you're not going to get a commentary on every passage as I mentioned, but for most passages you're at least going to get some and you're going to get quite a few. Um, so uh, it, it's a great app to have and even though I have a fairly good library of the church fathers, I often use that app just because it's a quick way to find out fast you know, what, are the, what the church fathers say on that subject. There's another free app. It's not really an app, although it might be something you could download on phone, but I, I really don't know how it would work, and I don't think it would work as well. But there's a, there's a program you can download to a PC or a laptop, and it's called eSword. And uh, I have a, an article on this subject. If you go to my blog, it's, uh, it, it, the title of it is something like Computer-Based Bible Study for Free is the, is the title. But I have a link on my church website to this in my article section as well. But, uh, but it just has recommendations for stuff that's out there that's free that you can either find on the web or download. Well, the nice thing about this thing is, uh, the eSword, is, is you can download different versions of the Bible, including the Russian Synodal version, if you're a Russian speaker, but all other, other, other translations. You can download the Greek and the, the Hebrew text, and you can download different versions of it, and also the Septuagint Greek. You can download it in two forms, the straight Septuagint text, and then another text that has Strong's concordance numbers on the, on the words. And, uh, and those numbers tie into some uh, lexicons that they, you can also download for free. This is all public domain stuff if you're not paying for it. Uh, but, uh, but if you're, for example, looking at a King James text in this program, and you're wondering, what does that word mean in the original Greek? You can click on the Strong's concordance number, and then down at the bottom of your screen where your lexicons are, You'll, you'll see a bunch of uh, highlighted things that will pop up on certain tabs, and you click on the ones that are highlighted, and it will define the word for you. And uh, so if you aren't able to read the original language, it's a great way to get some idea about what it says. And you can also, I have, one, of the, one of the sets of commentaries I have, which is not cheap, is the uh, Ancient Christian Commentary series on the Bible. It, it's, it's a wonderful resource, but it's, it's not inexpensive. But you can actually download a digital copy of it, and it's only a couple hundred dollars, I think, if you download it on eSword. And then that commentary will be tied in with, this, with all the other commentaries that you download for free. And you can find pretty much most of what the fathers say about, about the scriptures that way and, uh, and have it at your fingertips. Um, I would still recommend that you have your hard copy Bible and that you read it. Studies have shown that we benefit more, we retain more information from reading a book than we do from reading things off of the screen. But, but these resources are great ways to research what the passage means. There are also a lot of public domain Protestant commentaries and you need to read them with some caution. But if you're just trying to find out, for example, when you're reading the book of Isaiah, 
and they're talking about some kingdom that you know, God's going to pour out his wrath upon. And you're wondering, what kingdom is this? What's the context? What is the prophet Isaiah talking about? Well, if you click on, say, Adam Clark or Matthew Henry's commentary, they're going to tell you at least what scholars in their time thought. And generally, those opinions haven't changed a lot on the big issues. So you're generally going to get pretty good historical information by, by using that. Um, I'll close with this quotation from St. John on, on the scriptures, and then if you have questions, we'll have questions and answers. But he says, Great is the profit to be derived from sacred scripture, and their assistance is sufficient for every need. Paul was pointing this out when he said, Whatsoever things have been written have been written for our instruction, upon whom the final age of the world has come, that through the, the patience and the, and the comfort of, of the scriptures we may have hope. The divine words, indeed, are a treasury containing every sort of remedy, so that whether one needs to, to put down senseless pride, to quench the fire of concupiscence, or to trample on the love of riches, or to despise pain, or to cultivate cheerfulness and acquire patience, in them one may find in abundance the means to do so. Thank you. Any questions? Well, it depends on the context. I mean, for example, you know, if, if, your, if your priest was teaching a Sunday school class, you might not want to get up and lecture him and, well, if only you knew the scriptures, you know. You, <laughs> you, 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 you want to make sure that you're talking to someone that, you, that it's appropriate for you to be sharing that information with. But let's say you're talking to a friend of yours and, and some issue comes up and there's a, there's a biblical answer. I don't see any reason why you shouldn't tell them what the Bible says about it. And, um, you know, in terms of how feeling out when it's appropriate to comment on your faith with people, in our culture, I don't know what it was like in other cultures or in other cultures today, but in our culture at least, I think most Americans don't want to hear your, your religious opinions if they don't know you. And so if you just go knocking on somebody's door like the Jehovah's Witnesses or the Mormons and you start saying, well, I'd like to share with you about the Orthodox faith, about 99, uh, 999 times out of 1,000, the door is going to be slammed in your, your, your face. But when you get to know people, and that's one of the reasons why we want to cultivate relationships with people who are not Orthodox. That's how we can bring people into the church. But when you develop relations with people, you, you, at a certain point, you earn the right to start talking to them about these things. And they'll listen to what you have to say because they know you. And so you, you have to pray that God will give you wisdom and that God will give you a door that will open. And then you have to keep you, your eyes out for those doors when they come. You don't want to let those opportunities pass. Any other questions? Um, what are the relative merits of reading um, the daily readings that are prescribed by the church or that are read liturgically or um, with compared to the method that you described with like four tabs? Well, I, I think it's good to read the daily readings, but you have to understand that if you read the daily readings, you're not reading the entire New Testament even, much less the Bible. And the other thing is, is that those readings are not always sequentially. Uh, you know, particularly the weekday lectionary and the Saturday and Sunday lectionary are obviously on different tracks when you, when you pay attention. Uh, and, uh, but it's a way of keeping in tune with the, with, the, with the church year, so I think it's a perfectly good way to do it. But I think that you, you also want to be just reading through your way through a book. Because when you read a book from beginning to end, and you, you see things in a different way than you would do when you're just reading some parts of it. And I'd point out that during Holy Week, the Typicon uh, says that this should be done probably in the cathedral, it's probably done, but m in most parishes it probably isn't. Although, I'm, since I'm going to be retired at 9 o'clock on Holy Tuesday and Holy Thursday, <laughs> uh, we're doing the, the Lenten hours with the pre-sanctified liturgy, and I'm going to do at least one gospel uh, for the first time. But the, the Typicon says all four Gospels are to be read on only Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday in their entirety during the hours. You divide it up into parts, but you're reading it straight through. And why is, it, why is that in the Typicon? Well, that was the period during Holy Week when Christ was teaching in the temple. So 
when you are in church and you're listening to the Gospels being read, this is a way of you commemorating that fact. You're being instructed by Christ. And uh, so, so just, just reading the daily readings is, is beneficial, but I think you want to read it from beginning to end. And there are times when the church tells us to do that anyway. So, uh, but uh, um, you, 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 there, there's a, the great canon is an example of a text that you can't really make heads or tails out of if you don't know the Old Testament. And most of the Old Testament is never read liturgically. But, uh, but there are so many references in that canon that if you have read the Bible, you get it. If you haven't read the Bible, there's just names and references, and they go whiz and pass. So, over the years, I've been found out about myself and disciplining myself to make that time that you talked about mm -hmm. to study. And what's been a huge help for me is at our church, we have a Tuesday night Bible study. And doing that, I mean, I'm so glad when I go every week, even though I've come to the end of my day and I say, oh, I don't want to do this. But when I get there, it's, a, it's just a huge blessing. So. It's, it's great to have a parish do that. And that's another thing when I'm retired that I intend to start doing in my own parish. But. Uh, but the, one of the nice things, as I mentioned, is Presbyterian Eugenia Constantino does one basically on Ancient Faith Radio every week. And so you get to participate in that one if you're not able to go to one where you're actually in person. But there, there's benefits of the Bible study beyond just studying the Bible, and that's the fellowship that you get out of it. And also the, the ability to interact is a lot different. You can ask questions. You could email Presbyterian Eugenia Constantino, uh, but uh, it's not quite the same thing as being there and being able to talk to someone in person. Any other questions? Uh, Father, what do you think of reading the book of uh, Apocalypse? When I'm, the Apocalypse. How, what do you think of people reading it? I think that there's no reason not to read it. It's just that um, it's not the easiest book to read. And what, what a lot of, what, what, I, what I always have heard from people, you know, biblical scholars, they complain that that's the first book of the Bible that many people read, and it's really the last book of the Bible that people should read. Because you can't understand the apocalypse if you haven't read the rest of the Bible. It's full of images that are all drawn from the rest of Scripture. And um, one, one resource that I forgot to mention that's now available, and that's um, Archbishop of Erke's introduction to the New Testament in four, three parts. Uh, so you've got the, uh, the Gospels, which is wonderful, the, his approach to the Gospels is he kind of does a harmony of the Gospels. He, he, he basically goes from the beginning references to Christ to the, to the resurrection and the ascension, and he ties all the Gospels together. He gives you a lot of explanations that you would find, say, in Blessed Theophilact's commentaries. Uh, but it's, it's a great resource. One of the things I like about it, particularly like you're preparing a homily on the Gospel, it's nice to look at there because he'll tell you is there a parallel passage in another gospel? And, and a lot of times those parallel passages share, shed light on your passage uh, that uh, you would have missed if you didn't, weren't aware that it even existed. But then he also has the, the, the book of Acts, and then there's one volume that's the epistles and the apocalypse. And uh, so it's not ridiculously expensive. It's published by Jordanville. And if you have that, at least when it comes to the New Testament, you'll have a really good guide in terms of how the church understands these texts. So I would definitely recommend it, particularly if you really want to dig into it, you want to have that. Well, it's a great be accuracy of some of the older Catholic Bibles like the Vulgate or the Word of Jerusalem. Well, the Vulgate is, is, a, is a fairly accurate translation. What's interesting is that it often is kind of somewhere between the contemporary Hebrew text that we have in the, in the Masoretic text and the Septuagint. So it doesn't always line up with the Septuagint, but St. Jerome intentionally translated his text from the Hebrew text that were available in his time. And so it's good evidence that the Hebrew text was changing because we can see sort of a snapshot of where it was in his time as opposed to where it is now. And there's a lot of stuff in there that is not in the Masoretic text today. Um, the Douay Reims is an old... Catholic translation that's not bad. I mean, it's not bad to reference, particularly if you wonder what did the Latin text say, because that's a translation from the Latin. It's not an easy to read translation, and it's also got a lot of awkward terms uh, that, that Roman Catholics used to stick to, but I think now they've kind of gone over to using Protestant terminology when it comes to like names of people in the Bible and stuff. Um, the Jerusalem Bible 
is based on the, in the New Testament on that uh, sort of recreated or reconstructed Greek text. And so it wouldn't be a bad text to refer to, but it's not going to be, it's not really the text the church has preserved. One other thing I should mention about translations is there are, there are translations that are fairly literal, and then there are translations that are sort of, they call dynamic equivalents, and then there are paraphrases. And the problem with paraphrases and dynamic equivalent translations, and the Jerusalem Bible definitely falls into that category, is you're not really getting a translation, you're getting sort of an explanation of the text, but it's coming from a particular perspective. And so what is not clear in the original text, they'll make clear by telling you what they think that it means, but, they're, but you're getting their commentary. Whereas with the King James text, for example, it's, it's very literal. It's not woodenly literal, but it's very literal translation of the text. And so if there's an ambiguity in the text, they leave it there. And, uh, and there are a lot of places, for example, St. Paul uses a phrase, uh, he uses the phrase the flesh a lot in his epistles. Now, the flesh could mean this, but it could also mean your sinful nature. And so the NIV usually translates it as sinful nature, but there are some places where whether it's the flesh physically or whether it's the sinful nature, or maybe even both, is not really clear in the text, but if you're reading the NIV, you'd never know that there was an ambiguity there because they, they, they fill in the gaps for you, but you're getting a Protestant evangelical interpretation of the text. Well, also, like, a lot of biblical texts are, I mean, it's, it's written with the cultural metaphors, right? Like, uh, when it says, you know, it's, it's easier for a counselor to go through eye of a needle than a rich man to go heaven, it doesn't actually mean a camel. But the word is, you know, it's not like the word camel, but the word is the word that it's used for a camel. It's actually meaning a rope going to spindle of a boat, a ship. So that's what it actually means. But some people actually really think it's a camel going to have a which is impossible. Well, there, the fathers actually give more than one interpretation. There are some fathers that give an explanation like that. But there are some that say that it's talking about a camel going through a eye of a needle. I think the point is that it is impossible. But then, but, but the apostles, they, they say to Christ, well... You know, well, that's impossible. And he says, well, with God, all things are possible. So it's possible for a rich man to do it. It's just not possible naturally. So, but the thing is, what you wouldn't want to have is a translation that just took the leap and interpreted the, that text for you and didn't use the words that Christ actually used or something equivalent to it. Because, uh, because then you, you don't really know. Uh, you don't know whether you're getting an interpretation or whether you're getting... Uh, you know somebody's opinion and paraphrases like the Living Bible or the Good News Bible. Those are really bad paraphrases that you really don't want to use. I mean, if you use it at all, it would just be to find out what does some Protestant think this text means, not not as a translation of the actual text. So we've gone from having one uh, English translation for a long time to now different varieties, some more academic, and others done uh, maybe like five. Well, there is a there is a translation of the Septuagint that you can now get on Lulu.com. It's it was edited by a guy by the name of Michael Asser, and because well, let me explain one thing. If you if you got a, a, a copy of the Bible, you, you probably wonder why are these pages so thin. Well, they're so thin because if you want to have a Bible that's a manageable size, the paper has to be thin. Otherwise, you'd have a Bible that was like this thing. Well, Lulu.com is print on demand, and they don't do you know fine paper. Uh, so, so that text, if you get it, you have to get four uh, volumes of it. And it's also it's a little bit small in the font, but it's actually not a bad text. What what he did was he took the King James, and he corrected it with the Septuagint. And so as a liturgical translation, it's a, it's a pretty good one. It's just not, unfortunately, yet published in a really easy to get, nicely bound, one volume text. Uh, another translation of the Septuagint that's not bad is uh, the one that's done, it's also fairly inexpensive. It's by Sir Lancelot Brenton. Uh, it's a bit wooden in some places. He uses some really Greeky words for names. Uh, like Nebuchadnezzar, I think, is Nebuchadnezzar or something like that that will throw you. Uh, but, uh, but it's not a bad translation. And the nice thing is, is the edition that I've usually seen has the English and the, and the Greek in parallel columns. So if you have any ability to read the Greek, you can kind of compare the text when you're, when you're reading through it. 
Um, there's, a, there's a scholarly translation of the Septuagint, when I say scholarly, you know, modern American scholarship, okay? So take it for what it's worth. But the New English translation of the Septuagint is, uh, is not a bad text to have for reference, but I have big issues with it. I would never use it liturgically. And, 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 and these scholars, unfortunately, a lot of Protestant scholars, they, they'll do things just because they want to be different, because if you do the same thing that everyone's always done, you don't get noticed. And uh, so, for example, in Genesis 1, they translate the Spirit of God moving across the face of the waters as uh, the, the, I think it's the wind of God, you know, moving across the, the, the Spirit of, uh, 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 moving across the waters. Not, they don't translate it as Spirit. And the thing is, one thing about the King James translation is when King James commissioned the translators to produce that translation, he gave them rules. And even though he was a Protestant, one of the rules he gave him was translate it in a way that matches the way that it's usually been understood by the fathers of the church. And, and uh, so, for example, you know, the title, Search the Scriptures, this is a, that's, that's from the Gospel of John. And that's a passage that only the King James gets right. And, and that's because in Greek, you could translate that same sentence as... Uh, you search the scriptures. In other words, it's just, if, if, you took, if you read it that way, what Christ would be saying to the Pharisees is, you search the scriptures, and in them you think you have life. But the way the church has always understood it is it's not just a statement of fact that you're searching the scriptures. He's saying, search the scriptures. So it's a command. And, and, and St. John Christum understands it that way. All the fathers of comment, as far as I'm aware, read that as a command. But the King James is the only translation, the, the new, new King James Version, unfortunately, notwithstanding. They also get it wrong. Uh, so having a translation where people are trying to interpret it in accordance with the church tradition is important, and these guys don't do that. They're, they, they feel perfectly free to interpret the text in ways that no Christian would ever read it. And, uh, but as a reference, if you're just wondering you know, to get a better idea of what the Greek says, sometimes it's useful. They also use really strange names. Uh, like for David, for example, they have it as like Dawood or something. Well, you know what? In the New Testament, we don't have Iesus, we don't have Iacobos, we don't have, uh, you, know, you know, Paulos. We don't use Greek forms of the names that are commonly used in English. We translate them into the commonly used forms of the names. Why would you produce a translation like that? I, I just don't get that. And that also reminds me of the King Jacobo's tr uh, translation. Uh, there, there's, there's a schismatic monastery in Buena Vista, Colorado, that produces what they call the Orthodox New Testament, which has some good patristic footnotes, so it's not a horrible thing to have, but it's, it's done in a woodenly literal way. So, for example, he has Christ saying, be doing this in remembrance of me. That's like a, if you were in a first-year Greek class and you were trying to make it clear to your professor that you understood the verb there, you would say, be doing this. But you would never say that in English. You would never translate a text like that of, of the Bible. And, and also, for, for James, he uses Jacobos. Because Jacobos, that makes all the difference in the world to know that Jacobos is, is the Greek form of the name there, not James. Well, I, I, I can't remember the explanation for how we got James in English as opposed to Jacob, but we did some kind of way. And, and, and so when we talk about St. James, we know what we're talking about. When we talk about the epistle of St. James, everybody knows what you're talking about. If you say, in the epistle of Jacobus, no one's going to know what you're referring to. So, so don't, why, why bother with that kind of nonsense? You, you had a question. Yeah, uh, are there any recommendations on how to read the Bible, standing up, sitting down? Well, I think that if you were reading it liturgically, you would read it standing up, but if you're, if you're just reading it for study, I don't think it's wrong to be sitting. Um, and, um, it, you know, if, if you think about, uh, well, you know, in, in the time of Ezra, there's a passage where it talks about him reading the law to the people, and it says the people all stood. So, I mean, that's certainly probably the, the ideal way that you would hear the scriptures, but I would say, I, I, I don't think that it's wrong to read it sitting down. I think that there's enough examples of the fathers where they, they, they uh, would have been studying the scriptures in ways other than just standing the whole time, but I don't think that's a bad thing. I don't think that's any problem. As long as you read it. You, just obviously, if you're getting to the point where you're dowsing off, uh, or, or dozing off, it's, it's not going to be as beneficial. But uh, 
Try to read it earlier in the day, maybe. Just bigger in the Orthodox Church here, I mean, a father Paul Tarasi for explaining the scriptures. Do you recommend his works and his commentaries on that? I know it's like more of an academic way to approach the scriptures, but what do you think about that? Who are you referring to? Father Paul Tarasi. Um, I, I would not recommend his stuff, I, and I'll tell you why. Uh, I'm sure that Father Paul is a well-meaning man, but I, I spent four years studying liberal Protestant biblical scholarship, and um, Father Paul's stuff is like warmed over Protestant biblical scholarship with a little orthodoxy sprinkled on top. And uh, so, for example, he has an introduction to the Old Testament. If you read the one that's on the Pentateuch, uh, or the Law of Moses, he talks about a theory that's called the JEDP theory, but he just talks about it as a fact. And he gives you the theology of the sources that Protestant scholars believe are behind the text of the Book of Moses. So he talks about the theology of the J source, the E source, the P source, the D source. Well, there, you don't find that in the church fathers. I mean, that's not orthodox commentary. And uh, even good Protestant scholars would not approach it that way. There's a, there's a Protestant scholar I think passed on, but his name is Brever Childs, and he was a, I think he taught at Yale, but he's, he was considered to be one of the more important Old Testament scholars uh, in, of the last half century. And he came up with an approach to scripture that's called the canonical approach. And even though in, in many respects he was very liberal in terms of his understanding of how the Bible was put together, his, what made him different was he said, look, however these books came together, we have to talk about what does the canonical form of the text mean, because that's the form of the text that the church has preserved, and so it has a meaning as it is. So you can hypothesize about your sources all you want. There's no way that you can know that there weren't four sources that made the, the Pentateuch, but there's also no way that you can know that there are. I, when I was a Protestant, I actually put together a study book for a small group that I was teaching, and I composed it from four sources. I took, I took a, a, a manual by Charismatic. I took the Nazarene manual, which has a doctrinal statement, and the Salvation, Handbook of, the Salvation Army Handbook of Doctrine, because I was from the Wesleyan Holiness tradition. And then I kept my own ideas. And I, put, I weaved four sources into one coherent text. And we, we went over this thing in, my, in this Bible study. I didn't want people to analyze the sources and try to figure out which, where is the Salvation Army uh, Handbook of Doctrine source in this text. I put together a text that I was intending to be interpreted the way that it is, and I, I don't believe that any of the books of the Bible were put together so that we could try to find out how they were put together. I, I, just, I don't believe that, and, and, and that's the approach he takes. There's a really good critique of him that was written by a Lebanese Archimandrite and it's available on orthodoxinfo.com, and I, I think he takes it, a, it takes him apart pretty well. Like I said, I don't, I'm not casting any aspersions in the guy's piety. I'm sure he came of age at a time, and he was exposed to Protestant biblical scholarship, and he probably thinks he's doing the church a favor by helping us to understand this scholarship, but understanding in a way that he was able to synthesize and still maintain his faith. Uh, I just don't think that that was the proper approach. I went to Texas uh, a couple of years ago. I had family in Houston, and the first church I went there uh, it was a Western Rite Orthodox church. And uh, it was kind of interesting. Like, the liturgy was like a hodgepodge of Orthodoxy, Catholicism, and Protestantism. Right. So um, I, I went to Holy Archangel's monastery with because I was, I, was, I was curious and I wanted to get a monastery, so I went. And then the other day told me, don't go back to a Western Rite Orthodox church. You go to find a Greek Orthodox or Eastern Orthodox one that you know, has the Eastern Rite liturgy and you go there. So I did about St. George's in Houston, but I mean, are the Western Rite Orthodox churches, I mean, are they really, I mean, they're agreeing with us, but are they really good to go to? I mean, well, I know the, the priest who just retired from that parish and the current priest, and they're both good men. And uh, I, I personally wouldn't go to a Western Rite service, but I wouldn't say that they're not Orthodox. But, uh, and I would say that that's a fairly sane example of a Western Rite parish. There are a lot of Western Rite parishes that are pretty weird. And the problem is, the problem with the Western Rite, it's sort of like the Jurassic Park version of liturgics. You know, you're, you're, you're taking some, some dinosaur and you're trying to bring him back to life and say, okay, now here's the Western Rite. But nobody really knows what 
the Western Rite was on, on the fine points. One thing, if you, if you ever are, are serving the services of a clergyman, you discover that you can have a service book, but the service book doesn't really tell you all the stuff that you need to know to know the services. You have to have someone who knows how to do the services that instructs you at it. Uh, and uh, when you're recreating a, a, a rite that's been lost, who's that person? So that would be my answer to that. How did you discover orthodoxy? Well, I was studying to be a Protestant minister, and I started reading the Fathers of the Church. And the, 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 well, the, the interesting thing was is the, the, the Wesleyan holiness movement that I was raised in, they come from the Methodists, which come from the Anglicans, and the Anglicans historically have some appreciation for tradition. The three-legged stool of Anglicanism is, is that scripture is primary, but you interpret it with tradition and reason. Uh, John Wesley added experience, so they had the, the Wesleyan quadrilateral, or you could say the four-legged stool of Methodism. Uh, but the funny thing was is that when it came to anything outside of Christology or, or the doctrine of the Trinity, you never heard from the church fathers in, in the Church of the Nazarene, certainly not when I was growing up. And they, basically, they let the church fathers out of their cage to talk about the, the Trinity, or Christology, but that, okay, we're done, go back in your cages, we don't want to hear anything you have to say, we're going to just go with the Bible from here on out, thank you very much. But anyway, I, I was analyzing some, an issue, because I had some professors that were very liberal, and they were challenging my understanding of scripture that I'd been raised with. And, uh, and so I, I had an opportunity to write a paper, actually the assignment was to write a paper on my understanding of the inspiration of scripture. And the, everybody in the class had the same assignment. So I thought, well, I'm going to use the West End Quadrilateral to find out uh, how I should understand the inspiration of Scripture. So I look at what the Bible says about itself, but then the next step was tradition. So I thought, okay, what did the church fathers say about the inspiration of Scripture? And I started digging into what the fathers had to say. And eventually I thought, you know what? You could solve every problem, a doctrinal problem, if you just say, what has the church always believed? But once you find the answer to that question, you found the answer, and you're done. So, uh, so uh, basically, I thought I'd discovered a new method. I was going to write a book and become famous. And then I discovered somebody had already thought of that, the Orthodox Church. And so, that, so, so I met an Orthodox priest, and uh, one thing led to another. So time up.